morning, everybody. Good morning, LVC. Good morning. So exciting to see people. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's like a miracle, a miracle Sunday this uh, Saturday. We're preparing for Sunday. It's really a joy to be with everyone. Um, this morning, we're trying out a new thing here at LVC. We are having a small group, a home group here as I uh, teach the word in our garden. And it's just really a joy to see the faces of loved ones and friends that we haven't been able to connect, but we are socially distanced. We are masked, except for me because of the lipstick. And uh, we are here just to learn about God together. So good morning to all of you who are tuning in. My name is Lily and I have the great joy of being a part of LVC and get the privilege of talking about the book of Luke this morning. So. Welcome to all of you, and um, let's just pray before we get started. God, thank you for people. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your house. Thank you for this circle, this gathering. Thank you for the blue skies and the sun. Lord, it's like we're just sitting in your living room this morning. We're just sitting in your company, in your presence. And Lord, we have come with our own ideas and expectations, but we just push that aside and we just say, God, we want to hear from you. We want to connect to you. We want to be just in step with you, God. So this morning, through your word, through this um, time together, would you bring us closer to you, God? And we just say we are willing and we surrender. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm sure for many of us during this time of the pandemic over the last year, we have had many, 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 many meals alone or together with our families. And for across the world, we've kind of seen on social media in particular, lots of people talking about the things that they're making while they're at home. They have a bit more maybe time on their hands. We've seen, you know, sourdough take off in a new way. We've seen, you know, really creative inventions. And it's been true for our house too. We have been cooking a lot, eating a lot. I think I probably have mentioned this in every sermon I've given in the last year, the amount of food I've eaten. Just so you know that I know how much I've eaten. I know it's also apparent that there's some fruit of that, uh, of that uh, feasting in my life. Um, but as I look at the book of Luke, I really resonated with the passage that I'm reading today in 22 because it's yet again another time where Jesus and his disciples are gathered around a meal. The book of Luke is kind of interesting. As I started looking into this passage, it has so many meal scenes or scenes around meals. In fact, there's at least 10, and um, you'll see here a list of the 10 verses that you can do a fun Bible study if you'd like to about mealtime with Jesus or dinner time in, in Luke. Luke seems to really hone in on the dinner scene. He seems to hone in on moments where people are gathered around food because it's starting to also be the moment where Jesus does some serious teaching, some serious revealing of himself and his plan, some serious correction of his disciples, and always, 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 there's some really beautiful um, affirmation he does with his followers. And so in this passage in Luke 22, following on what Pastor Joshua taught us last week, we see an extension of the Last Supper and what it looks like when Jesus has this extended meal with his followers right before his crucifixion. And how does he spend this last meal with them? So if you were with us last week, you would have seen that passage of the Last Supper and Jesus demonstrating what his body and his cup was. And in, this, in the end of that passage that Pastor Joshua shared with us last week, Jesus says to his disciples, look, one of you here is going to betray me. And it ends at a really tense point. And if you can imagine just for a minute, being both Luke, the author, who's trying to categorize and, and, and document really carefully what has happened in Jesus's life and what's happened as he's followed uh, his followers have been, you know, walking with him. So there's Luke's perspective, you know, listening to Mark and other sources and saying, these are the things that happen and, and they happen a lot around meals. And then also Jesus's disciples who at this very beautiful moment where Jesus introduces this really profound sacrament of communion, he doesn't do it like in the temple. He doesn't do it in a holy place. He does it at the Passover table. He does it at a place that is common to them, that they've been to year after year, that would be familiar to them. And at that table, he puts forward this, this prophecy, one of you will betray me. And where we start today in Luke 22 picks up right on that and continues in that tension. So let me read for you Luke 22 verses 24 through 30. I'm going to start with that and then we're going to go to the latter half of that verse a little later in the sermon. 
a dispute arose among those who were with Jesus. And sorry, a dispute also arose among them to which whom was the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. For those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest, the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may, not, so you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on a throne, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So in this passage, we see the disciples right after Jesus in verse 21 has said, you know, one of you is going to betray me. They now shift in 24 to saying, who's the greatest among us? And I couldn't help but think about the many dinners we've had during this pandemic. Like all of you, you know, we spent those first, especially two months, not socializing with anybody at all. We were just us and our family. And so on the one hand, that was beautiful. There was moments of connection. Ben taught the kids, you know, how to play spades. And, and we had, you know, kind of fun memories. We were cooking together. There were really nice moments. But then if your family is like my family, there were plenty of moments where we sat in silence where we sat annoyed, where people would get up mid-meal, people would come late to the meal, where we would just all say, we have this thing in our family called a free-for-all, where you just put food on the table and you take it and you go somewhere else. Like you don't sit at the table, you know? And so our dinner scenes really kind of look a lot like what happens in the, in the book of Luke. You know, there are moments of real deep connection, but then there are moments where tensions rise. And it's just so curious to me that the disciples in this moment where they are having this beautiful, intimate moment with Jesus for the third time, actually, in the book of Luke, we see a tension arise around who is the greatest, that that is actually their focus. They actually start to debate in this really precious moment, who is the greatest? And the reason I think that that is, the reason I think that in this moment of great intimacy and maybe even confusion for them, they start to try and position themselves and figure out who they are is because it goes to the question that all of us are thinking about, I think, all the time, and a question I want us to consider today. Who am I? And does anyone really know me? Does anyone really know me? Does anyone really understand me? In the last year, we have been isolated from other people and from loved ones in a way that we never have before. And I know for me, in the gap of being with people, in the gap of not having human touch or feedback or communion, I've started to ask myself over and over again, who am I? God, who am I? And so when I sit down with Jesus, when I am at the table with him, that tension is there, that confusion about, God, what's my role? Shouldn't I be doing this? Shouldn't I be doing that? And in fact, recently at work, I had a situation where I you know, started a new job in September. It's been about almost, quite, almost six months. I've only met a handful of my colleagues. I've only ever met them virtually on a screen. I've met a few of them in person. And I had a situation arise in work where there was a tension between me and a colleague that developed. And I think it was primarily because we were trying to do really hard things over a screen and over email and not having the human connection that we needed. So my immediate impulse to resolve that issue was to meet for coffee. And I just said, look, we've never met before. Why don't we meet for coffee and just talk? Because maybe that would help us. And I think that instinct in me is the instinct that Jesus knew his disciples needed and the instinct that he has towards us as a father, that when things get muddled, when we start to forget who we are, we start to think and assert ourselves in different spaces, his instinct is to pull us to the table. His instinct is to say, let's meet, let's talk, let's commune together. So this whole breaking of bread and taking the cup for us is Jesus' invitation, not just once a month as we do in LVC, but it's an ongoing invitation for us, I think, to come and sit with him, to get up in the morning, have your cup of chai, and maybe read God's word. Have your cup of coffee and listen to worship. You know, have your morning meal and maybe you're rushing and you don't have the margins to, to do that, but maybe you just take five minutes and you just come and you sit with God. Because there's something really powerful that happens at the table that doesn't seem to really happen anywhere else in scripture this communion with his disciples, this correction. 
And that's so key because everything in us, especially in this year, wants to assert who we are again. We need to be affirmed. You know, we haven't had the normal indicators of our success. We haven't had the normal markers or benchmarks to say you're doing well, you're progressing well, you know? For me, I remember in my first job in particular, and a lot of my issues come up around my job for me because like many of you, I was started a career, then I had kids, and so my career has been really muddled. It's been a few things here, lots of lags, a few things here, and so I know my insecurities are really caught up in my professional identity. And I can see in Jesus' disciples the same thing, actually. Their identity, their security around being his followers is caught up, and, they, and they're expressing that in this whole who is the greatest conversation. But Jesus says to them something really really profound. Don't be like that. Very simple. Don't be like that. It reminds me of what we say at our dinner ta- t- table often. Stop doing that. Don't say that. Don't touch him. Don't touch her. Everyone, just everyone be quiet. You know, it's like that's what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples here. Don't be like that. Look, I know that society would honor the most elite, the most established person in any gathering. They would put them at the head of the table. And for any of us who have lived in the continent for any length of time, we know protocol is king here. No meeting starts without the guest of honor being acknowledged. Whenever there are speeches, it is definitely the least person who starts and the most important person who finishes. Protocol helps us to know where we are, right? It, 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 it orders us, it orients us to who we are in this world. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, forget all that. That's actually not how it's going to work with me. It's not how it's going to work actually anymore for you. Now you're no longer going to be the first, but if you are going to be the first, you're actually going to be the last. And if you are going to be the wisest and the the best, you're going to actually be the youngest. Because why? Because that's what I'm doing. That's who I am. You see, I used to live in this beautiful, perfect place. (laughs) And I actually took a massive bridge called the cross and came down and sat with you to show you exactly what I'm trying to get you to do which is to give up your rights to who you should be and your established reputation and your identity and your self-esteem and all those things and consider a new way of existing with others and a new way of existing with God. Because it wasn't just their relationship to society that was ordered by these rules of the oldest being the most respected or the most, you know, the Pharisees having the right to command certain respect. It was also how they related to God. Everything in the Jewish system of worship was ordered in this way. It was all about having purity of access. It was all about the the highest of the high holy leaders being the one to navigate the path to God on behalf of the people. But Jesus is saying, that worked for a time, but now I'm going to show you a new way. Now I'm going to show you a different way. So when you start to feel uptight about who am I, what's my identity, aren't I aren't I? Well, I'm not going to deny Jesus. So that means I must be the greatest, right? Because I'm not, I'm not going to turn him over. But then that make, what is that position does that give me? Or, you know, I'm not the oldest, but I'm not the youngest either. Jesus is saying, put all that aside, consider a different way of interacting with me and a different way of interacting with others. And I think all of this leads us to the next part of the passage in Luke. Why is he emphasizing, you know, getting rid of these Uh, preconceived notions? Why is he emphasizing moving away from the way that society and Jewish society was structured? Because he knows things are about to change for him. So let's look at Luke verse 22 verses 31 through 38, the latter half of this dinner time conversation. So Jesus has just said to them, don't be like the world. Don't be like the ones who need honor. Be like me. Be found serving. And then he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as you were wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, you'll strengthen your brothers. But he replied, and this is Simon Peter replying, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And can you imagine Jesus here just sighing like you would at a dinner table, like, Lord, I have heard this before. And him just sighing and saying, I tell you, Peter, Before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It's written, and he has numbered with the transgressors. 
and I tell you that this will be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replies. <laughs> I mean, if this isn't a dinner time conversation, like in a pandemic, I don't know what is. Honestly, it's like Jesus has his quarantine, you know, these people that he's chosen to kind of be isolated with. And I'm wondering at this point if he's kind of regretting that he, these are the 12, these are the 11 that he's decided to hang out with. You know, we've been really fortunate that we've had a quarantine, you know, essentially a family that we've kind of gotten together with maybe every other week or so throughout this pandemic. And there was a time where we stopped getting together. I think we all were like, you know what, that's just, just, just. We'll see you next month. You know, it just kind of got to be old. And, I, and I'm sure Jesus, you can just hear the exasperation in his voice saying, you know, I tell you, Peter, today you're going to mess up. You know, and at the end, him saying, look, y'all are not getting me. You don't go out and build an armory of, of, of artillery for this work. It's enough. Like you can just feel Jesus' tension. And yet at this dinner table, at this place, these very words, this correction, this kind of let me tell you how it is, is the exact thing these disciples will need in order to follow him. These are the exact words they need. They need these harsh, serious words. And why? Well, right, because at the very beginning, this part about what Jesus says to Simon, and I think it's not just to Peter. I think his message to Peter was to everybody at that table, and certainly Luke captured it as a message to all of us today. So what does he say? He says, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. So I am Ethiopian. You guys know this already. I've told you this before. In Ethiopia, our main grain is not wheat. It's teif, this uh, kind of, yeah, very healthy grain. And it is actually cared for just like wheat. It is, it is harvested and uh, produced just like wheat. So during certain times of the year in Ethiopia, you will go through the countryside and you'll see these large bay hails, which you can see here in the picture, of teif. And what the farmers do first is they take the teif and they have their oxen trample on it first to break up the stock and to break up the, the fibers. So that's the first thing that happens. It's just kind of crushed over and over again. And you'll see it's very old school still in Ethiopia. You'll see these oxen just, you know, trampling on the teif. The next thing they'll do is they'll take a big pitchfork and they'll start tossing it up. And as they toss it up, those heavier stalks that are the outside of that teif seed will fall away and they'll start to separate. But it's not quite done. It's a, a difficult grain. It's super small. And then after they start throwing it up in the air, the next thing they do is they'll take two baskets and they'll toss it one more time. They'll toss it one more time. It's a long, lengthy process. And in that last tossing it back and forth, all the good aif, all the good grain will fall to the ground. This passage here about Satan asked to sift you for wheat really spoke to me. Because what I saw in it that I hadn't seen before it's not that the trials won't come. They will. There will be the trampling on of our hopes and our dreams and our disappointments will overtake us. That will happen. It's not that we will not be tossed up and you know, dislocated. How many of us, we had dear friends who had to up and move in the last 12 months because they lost jobs, they got sick, you know, tragic things happened and they were tossed into the air and, and completely you know, shifted out of their current homes and their current, op current lives. It's not that we'll avoid all that. We won't. We will absolutely experience it. But what I think he's saying to Peter and what Luke is saying to us today is don't let what happens in life separate you from me. Don't let what happens in life, what tramples you, what disappoints you, what crushes you, don't let that separate you from me like a grain of wheat be separated from the stock, like the teif would be separated from the fibers. Don't let what you're trampled on and tossed around about and the disappointments that take you unexpectedly and texts that you get in the middle of the night and unexpected news that comes or just the numbness of having to walk through an entire year of quarantine and disappointment and uncertainty. Don't let that separate you from me. That's the message. That's why he was trying to get them out of their heads about being the greatest. That's why he's saying, look, come serve because that's why I am. You, if you need me, if you want to find me, I'll be serving. That's where you'll find me. You're not going to find me in the pretty church. You're not going to find me in the pretty situation. You're going to find me in the streets. And in those streets, you're going to be trampled on. In those streets, people are going to reject you. In those streets, people are going to doubt you, question you. You will be disappointed. You will be hurt. You will be frustrated. And Satan is asking, can I sift you? 
And it was that seven. What he's saying is, I want to separate you. But what does Jesus promise us? Neither life nor death will separate us from the love of God. So don't let circumstance, don't let what you're walking to separate you from me. And look how gracious Jesus is to Simon Peter, who he's about to say to him, you're about to disappoint me this very day in these 24 hours, you're about to disappoint me. In the very next sign, he says, I've prayed for you. Hallelujah. He's prayed for us. He has prayed for us. And his prayer, you talk about efficacious. Jesus' prayers are efficacious, okay? I know that's on all of our minds right now. Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson, who, who are we taking, right? We're taking Jesus. We're taking Jesus. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. We're going to turn back. I have had my moments this year. I'm telling you, I, I told Ben before I preached this, I'm not preaching again. I, should, I, I am not worthy to do this, you guys. I have struggled this entire year. This has not been a year of victory or encouragement for me. I have just struggled. I have had severe moments of depression. I have had severe moments of just overwhelming doubt and heart, heartache. But this gives me such hope. I've prayed for you. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. We're going to be okay. We are going to be threshed. We are going to be tossed. But God is praying that through it all, we would not be separated from him. Through it all, when we ask, who am I? Does anyone really know me? When we ask those questions, when our heart is still at night and nobody else is around, when we are up in the middle of the night, hurting and wondering, God, do you know me? What he's saying to you is, I know you. My one prayer is that you wouldn't be separated from me. My, my, I, I just don't want you to go far from me because when you go far from me, that's when you start to wonder, who am I? When you go far from me, that's when you start to question who you are, what your place is, and you start to look for those external indicators that you're doing okay. You start to look for that affirmation from your boss or your job or your family or your partner. And now your poor you know, husband like Ben has to be everything to you because I've not let God be anything. So now he has to be affirming to me and encouraging to me and covering me. That's not his role. That's Jesus's role. That's God's role in our life to be that everything to us. And in this moment, in this time, right before Jesus is about to face the loneliest and darkest moments of his earthly life, he is saying to them, look, trouble's coming. That's what the latter part, even about the going out and getting the swords, is about him saying, be prepared. Trouble is coming for you. There is going to be challenges. And, and of course, the disciples take it to be like, oh, bet. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to, you know, we're going to suit up. We're going to get what we need. We're going to go out, guns a blazing. And he's like, again, you, you've missed it. The, the swords that I'm talking about, the, the, the weapon you're talking about, as we learn later on in Galatians, is, is the spirit, right? It's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. That's, those are our weapons. And they, and they don't yet know that. And, and Luke, you know, later on in Acts starts to kind of unfold who they become. And we see God's grace in their lives such that they change the world. This very people that Jesus is sighing over and just like, Whew. do you ever have to like count to 10 before you talk to other people? That happens to me a lot. I just have to take a moment and just, just talk. I have to do that even before I send emails. I have to like take a second. Just, just, those people <laughs> that Jesus was sighing over here go on to change the world. I think the only way that they can do that is because they just decided, okay, whatever comes, because God prayed for us, because of his grace, we're able to stand and hold on to Jesus. We're able to stand close to him. So back to that dinner table. This passage ends and starts at the dinner table. And as I was thinking about, you know, okay, God, what does that mean for us? You know, if I'm thinking about who am I? And I'm wondering, what am I, you know, God, in your kingdom? And I have these questions and this year has been hard and things are still not clear. And I'm still not feeling terribly hopeful. What are the options for me? And I think the only option for us is to come to the table. And that Jesus would say to us, I know you. You're familiar to me. I have a message for you. I have an encouragement for you. One of the verses I didn't even touch on very much is earlier, I think it's in uh, verse uh, 28 or 29, where he says to him, you're, you're the ones who have stood by me. And you just think, they haven't stood by him, but that's the grace of God, right? That's the grace of God to say to us, you're not the best, but you're not the worst. <laughs> but more than anything else, I want you to know I love you. Look at what, how he affirms them. You're the ones who have stood by me. When you come back, you'll strengthen your brother. So if you are sitting here like I have many, many nights, I want you to say, I want you to know that God is saying, I know you. Let's have dinner, you know. 
This last picture, I just want to show you back to my Ethiopian food illustrations. You know, in our culture, food is very important as it is in, in many, many African cultures. And this eighth that I was telling you about is what makes our primary bread in Jera. And <laughs> what was that? Was that an amen? That was an amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, and when there are moments really in, in the everyday homes, but also on special occasions, injera is often eaten together around the same plate. So you'll see in this picture my kids, my nieces, my nephews, all sitting around one communal plate. Everybody's hands are going to be in there. It's going to be messing. It's very not corona friendly. But this is our culture. This is our tradition. You sit around a plate and you eat together. And it's a tight setting. It is not very comfortable. So what I want us this week to do, can you do one thing this week? Two things this week. One. Will you have dinner with Jesus some way, somehow? Whether that dinner looks like a walk, whether that dinner looks like get, just getting up 10 minutes early this week, just have a cup of tea with God, sit and listen, sit outside if you have access to outside. I've been listening to Kirk Franklin a lot this week. He has a great new uh, Tiny Desk concert out. Put on some worship, sit with some music. Can you, can you have dinner with God? Is there something he might want to say to you this week? Is there a correction he wants to point out? Is there a self-worth, self-esteem issue he wants to just, mm, just get in there and tweak a little bit? Is there a conversation that needs to happen, some laughter that needs to happen over dinner with you? Do you need to hear him say to you, you've been there with me, to hear him say, there's grace for you. So have dinner with Jesus some way, somehow this week, just you and him. I think the danger of this pandemic is that, you know, we've been disconnected from church. So it has felt like, okay, do I, how do I do church? But let me tell you, church was never a place. Church is us. Church is us. It doesn't take much. So have dinner with Jesus this week. And then secondly, even though I didn't talk about it a lot, this idea of serving is so central. That's why this tight dinner table is so beautiful to me, because that's how it's meant to be. Life in, in this pandemic has been so abnormal because we're not connected to each other. We can't physically gather or a communion like we want to, but we can still serve. And I think the power of that is that that's where we find Jesus. So if you're feeling like, I just don't, I feel distant from God. I, I, I'm not feeling, kind of, go serve somebody this week. Find a way. You could, you could take a meal. You could, you know, cover somebody's transport for the week. You could, you know, find a way. Don't, don't stress out about what the perfect thing is. Just do something. Find somebody who has to do something hard for themselves and do it for them. Just find that thing. And when you do that, you will find where Jesus is. That's where he is. He's serving. He's, he's humbling himself to serve us. And now, if we're feeling disconnected, if we're feeling like, God, I'm being, feeling tossed, I'm feeling like I'm up in the air, find a way to serve. Jesus says, that's where I'll be. So this week, if you want to know who you are, I think Jesus would say, I know you. Let's have dinner. Let's get together. Let's talk. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your love. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, God. Because I know who I am, I know where I've been, I know my thoughts and my habits, and you still choose to be my friend. You still choose to affirm who I am in you, God. So thank you. Thank you, God, for that mercy. And I pray this week, Lord, we could all just kind of walk a step closer to you. We could just say, God, nope, this, this year has separated us, and it's been hard. But God, nope, from today, today, this thing that's been separating me from you, my pride, my arrogance, my doubts, my disappointments, God, we surrender it all to you, God. And we just ask you, God, draw us close today. Help us to find the places where you are, to be inspired by your Holy Spirit, to serve others around us, God. Lord, we trust you. You're a good father. You're a good friend. You're a faithful brother. So we trust you and we worship you, God. You're good and we love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Reach out, friends. If you need encouragement, please reach out. There are lots of people who would love to pray with you and connect with you this week. God bless you. See you soon. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen.